Jesus here in Granada. It's uh, wonderful to see you all uh, here right now. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of our delegates uh, from across the world who are um, joining us via the Zoom feed. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce a colleague and a friend. Uh, Dave, how long have we been doing this now? 16 years. 16 years. 16 years. David was only a baby when we started. Uh, but um, uh, Dr. Dave Humphreys uh, is a professor of environmental policy at the Open University in the United Kingdom. Uh, he began his career specializing in international forest policy, on which he has written two, uh, uh, two comprehensive books, Forest Politics, The Evolution of International Cooperation, and Logjam, Deforestation, and the Crisis of Global Environmental Governance. Uh, he's also uh, published on climate change politics, geoengineering, the democratic regulation of transnational corporations and the, um, and the emerging jurisprudence of rights of nature. Uh, he's also someone that has been involved in policy and practice circles um, for, for his entire career. Uh, and he has led this research network for the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it's... Uh, it's wonderful that we get to hear him this year and his thoughts on where the world is coming and where the world is going right now. So thank you, Dave. Oh, thanks, for the, thanks for the kind introduction, Philip. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great shame, unfortunately, that Michelle Sato couldn't make it uh, because of um, illness. It's a great shame, but um, I hope um, I'll be able to sort of help partially fill that gap. Um, and we should also think of those who are not here, not just those who cannot be here, because of COVID, um, but also those who've not been given the opportunity to have a university education. We should remember that in my country, the United Kingdom, there used to be free university education, one that I personally benefited from, but in an act of intergenerational inequity, the UK government took that right from the young in 1998. And I think that illustrates the intergenerational dimension of, um, of change uh, that's central to our understanding of the Anthropocene, which is what we'll be talking about. So in this presentation, I'd like to look at some of the challenges that the Anthropocene raises for society and especially for the social sciences. And these are challenges that will affect everyone on the planet. And in the process, we'll look at two new discourses for tackling the global environmental crisis and the questions they raise. <clears throat> I'm not. Um, right, thanks. Um, this is the late Paul Crutzen, the uh, climate atmospheric scientist credited with coining the term the Anthropocene, the expression used to denote that we're now entering a new geological epoch where humans, we ourselves, are the dominant force for planetary change. Future generations will be able to find the traces of our civilization in the geological record. Plastics, radioactive isotopes, manufactured metal alloys, and so on. And I think the um, Anthropocene is a term that denotes both our power and our impotence, our power in that we've been able to transform the planetary biosphere without really wanting to, and our impotence in that we seem unable to agree what is now to be done. The Anthropocene is very much a no analog state. Um, current and future change is largely outside our knowledge and understanding. There's nothing that we can compare it with in the, in the history of the world. This is um, a power station, an advert for power from the United Kingdom. Uh, it's in our um, new third level environmental policy course, environmental policy in an international context. And we use this to illustrate the agency uh, structure uh, relationship. And you can see that the slogan at the top there, almost half the UK's carbon dioxide emissions, which cause climate change. That slogan is positioned over the power station but these, the uh, caption finishes are actually down to us and it's over the um, houses in the foreground. So I think that illustrates um, something that we'd be considering this week, which is the relationship between agency and structure. And where do we look for change? Yesterday's plenary speaker, 
uh, Professor Daniela Tilbury focused on big structural issues and in particular the role of education and how we uh, education can be transformed so that itself can exercise transformative change. This morning's plenary, uh, Professor Marta Ferreira Diaz focused more on the role of individual agents, citizens and consumers. So we need to consider both, of course. We need to consider both agency and structure as we've been doing this week. Uh, one doesn't need to be present in an environment in order to degrade it. Um, this, this gentleman, uh, this picture was taken in Niger. And that brings to mind, I think, the, the Bruno Latour's notion of action at a distance. Those who bear the consequences of an action are not necessarily those who cause it. The consequences of actions are distributed across networks of human and non-human entities. One may act to affect something in ways that are not easily understood. Now, we cannot conclude that this man in Niger is suffering solely due to anthropogenic climate change, um, but this one image does, I think, illustrate some important points. The relationship between nature and society and to what extent can they now be conceived as separate entities or to what extent must we imagine them as inextricably interbound with one another the spatial separation of cause and effect that there's a separation of cause and effect over both time and space and the questions of responsibility and how responsibility is distributed globally so on that theme this is Nira Padbaini, um, a vegetable farmer in, in the Bangladesh village of Pike Gacha, deep in the floodplains to the south of the country. We went and met him and, and other members of his village to, to make a film for the Open University about climate change. His environment has suffered salinization since a huge cyclone pushed salt water upstream in 1990. And when the floodwaters had retreated, the composition of the river had changed from fresh water to saline. A major change, in other words, to this man's environment. He has responded by growing saline tolerant vegetables. Uh, some of his neighbours have opened their fields, formerly rice paddies, uh, to the saline water in order to farm shrimp. Now, one of the questions I wanted to ask all our interviewees in Pike Gatcha was, have you ever heard of climate change? And as you would expect, if you were to ask that question in any country in the global north, the, the answers varied significantly. Nira Padbaini was the most eloquent of all. He had a level of understanding that was at least equal to the average um, person um, at this conference. He said the West has caused this damage. And we are only a small country, so I believe they should compensate us. Now, the question of compensation is quite often made in international environmental negotiations by the G77 countries, of, a group of developing countries from the global south. They, they argue that they should receive compensation from high polluters uh, because of the, the changes that they've suffered to their environment. This man was a very indignant yet dignified man. He gave us some fantastic hospitality. When we'd finished filming, he generously asked us to eat with his family. <clears throat> also from the same course, um, I commissioned this cartoon. One day, son, all of this will be yours. The, the idea of inheritance is that we usually bequeath to our children a, um, uh, good things, money, the family farm, the flat, the car or whatever. We pass on good things to our descendants. But this cartoon summarizes um, what we'll be passing on um, deforestation, pollution, chemical waste. Okay, so we use this, this um, concept to uh, bring to the fore um, the, 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 the notion of intergenerational equity and, and the, the, how our generation has in effect assumed for itself a privileged position at the expense of the young and those generations still to be born. Um, so do we bear historical, talking of responsibility, is that cumulative? Should we imagine that responsibility is cumulative? Do we bear responsibility in a historical sense for the greenhouse gas emissions and activities of our forebears? How can we discharge our responsibilities for our descendants in terms of effective planetary stewardship? that counters the momentum trends towards unsustainability, such as changes in land use, the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, car culture, vehicle manufacturing and road building, and the manufacture of chemicals that do not break down naturally, such as persistent organic pollutants and plastics. I'd now like to consider two 
new uh, policy ideas uh, that, that have only been around, well, less than 20 years, really. Um, one is the rights of nature, or earth jurisprudence, um, as it's sometimes known, an idea from South America, and in particular, the Andes Mountains. Now, the, the idea of rights of nature involves humility, it involves people uh, consciously placing nature first, people second. It aims to fundamentally reconfigure nature-society relations. Nature is treated as a subject, as a citizen almost, that has its own rights. So this is a very ecocentric notion that challenges the contemporary model of economic development and growth. Nature is at the heart of politics on this view. The second uh, no, uh, approach is geoengineering, which is very, very different. OK, it's, it's re-engineering the climate, trying to control the, the temperature of the planet on a global scale. Unlike rights of nature, this is a very hubristic and controlling discourse. It's, it's controlling on a gargantuan scale, on a planetary scale. It continues the technocrat technocratic paradigm. Indeed, it extends and deepens it. It's fraught with risk. It does not consider the contemporary model of economic development. It simply seeks to manage its consequences. So let's just have a look at these and find out where they've, they've come from. This is the General Assembly of the United Nations. You'll recognize this. Now, for some six years, I served as an advisor to the UK delegation to the United Nations Forum on Forests in New York. And during one of these meetings, um, one of my colleagues said to me, Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, is speaking in the General Assembly today. And I thought, I wonder if my pass will enable me to go into the General Assembly and hear him speak. So it did. I was able to go into the General Assembly and Evo Morales came to the podium and he said, this is in 2009, by the way, 60 years, he said, since the, the adoption of the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is time to recognize a new generation of rights, the rights of Mother Earth, the rights of Pachamama. And he, he argued that we need a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth. He then proposed that from the 22nd of April, which is known in many countries, including the United States as Earth Day, should henceforth be known within the UN system as Mother Earth Day. And that proposal was adopted by, by the General Assembly. So <laughs> this was the first time I'd heard of this. So I, I did some digging around to see what I could find out. And I've, I found out that the, the, the contemporary Earth jurisprudence on the rights of nature is very much the product of two streams of thought. One of them comes out of the United States of America, and in particular, this man, Christopher Stone, and his seminal um, paper, Should Trees Have Standing, which he then wrote into a book. And he argued that trees should have legal rights, the right to exist, um, the right to continue to thrive in the wild. And he argued that guardians, humans, um, should be able to uh, prosecute on behalf of trees in the courts. Now, that notion has not really taken um, root at the um, federal level in the United States, but as, as will be seen, it has taken root um, at the sub-federal level. This is Thomas Berry. He's very much one of the founders of contemporary earth jurisprudence. He argues that the rights of nature include uh, a river has the right to flow, species have the right to thrive in the wild, ecosystems and species have the right to migrate. Cormac Coulinan is a South African lawyer who's, who's one of the strongest contemporary voices on um, earth jurisprudence. Um, he's published widely on this. And there's also colleagues in Australia. Peter Burden is, is, is a leading authority on this, this subject. This is um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, this was one of the first um, uh, municipalities to adopt rights of nature in the United States. The first was Tamaqua Borough County, but Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania uh, was not far behind. So as I say, no recognition at the federal level in the United States, but there is recognition with some public authorities um, at a sub-state level. This is Rafael Correa, uh, the former president of Ecuador. 
And his significance is that he was president when the Ecuadorian constitution was rewritten and Ecuador became the very first country in the world to include rights of Pachamama or nature in its constitution. Article 71, nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structure, function and evolutionary process. All persons, communities, peoples and nations can call upon public authorities to enforce the rights of nature. That final sentence, I think, takes its inspiration from Christopher Stone's notion of guardians who can prosecute on behalf of nature. Bolivia was the second country to recognise at the national level um, rights of nature. Um, the following year, in 2010, the year after his General Assembly um, address, um, Ava Morales in the centre there uh, piloted the uh, passage of the law of the rights of Mother Earth uh, through the Bolivian legislature. So the, these are the first two countries ever to recognise this. The, also in 2010, um, Morales convened a civil society, uh, a mass gathering um, in Cochabamba, which is where the, the water privatisation protests took place. Uh, some 20 years ago, Morales had a role in that. Uh, he convened a civil society initiative in uh, Cochabamba, Cochabamba, which adopted a draft universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth. Morales was clearly hoping that having produced this draft, it would then be accepted as the basis for negotiation within the UN system and that it would be adopted by the General Assembly. That hasn't happened, unfortunately. But you can see there that some of the uh, principles that made it into the Universal Declaration that, of the right to, to live and to exist, the right to pure water, the right to clear air, the right to balance, these have um, found expression in the Universal Declaration or the draft universal declaration, but the, the draft declaration added some more, the right to be respected, the right to integral health, the right to be free from contamination, pollution and toxic or radioactive waste. That, this is a photo from the Cochabamba summit that produced the draft universal declaration. And as we heard, um, uh, from, from Lena's presentation yesterday. Um, there is now a dialogue on harmony with nature within the, um, the, the United Nations. On the 22nd of April every year, or as near to it as possible, uh, there is a, a dialogue, um, an interactive dialogue on harmony with nature that has seen the passage of some General Assembly resolutions in which it's noted that some states recognise the rights of nature. Now that is quite a weak and certainly non-legally binding declaration. But nonetheless, it's a tenuous um, toehold within the UN system. This, this principle is now finding expression within the UN system, even if it hasn't been adopted as um, a policy. And the first United Nations Environment Assembly um, did actually mention rights of nature, as did the Rio Plus 20 uh, summit. So we have a new jurisprudence. Uh, it's based on rights of nature, Mother Earth or Pachamama, as it's called in, the, in, in uh, Latin America. Buen vivir, the idea of good living. The idea that living well means treating others well, both other people, but also other species, treating nature well. There's a collective notion of property rights as opposed to the individual notion of property rights that we've grown used to. Um, but everybody has a share in um, property and how it's used. And we need to recognize this, a collective community notion of property rights. And it'd be also fair to say that both Rafael Correa and Ava Morales were strong critics of, of neoliberalism. They both set their stall against neoliberal um, global governance. So that's rights of nature. Now here's some headlines that we put in our environmental policy course. Um, that it's time for plan B. This is geoengineering. Two, two different periodicals there, as you can see, saying a plan B is where we need to start thinking of how to tackle global warming. Um, that, that we're not reducing fossil fuel emissions fast enough. So there's two types of geoengineering, um, as, as you'll see, good and bad. Um, solar radiation, well, it, all things considered, uh, the, the, the Earth's 
mean temperature is decided by two things. One is the amount of solar radiation that enters the atmosphere. So all other things being equal, the more solar radiation that enters the atmosphere, the higher the temperature. And secondly, the uh, amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, as, as we heard from David Driscoll yesterday. Um, the, the current con concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 417 parts per million. Okay, that's high. The scientifically accepted safe limit is, is, is 350. So therefore, if you're going to bring down the temperature of the Earth, you've really got to look at these two sets of meta variables. One is solar radiation management, reduce the amount of solar radiation that enters the atmosphere. And the second is to remove carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. The, the, the idea of, let's look at solar radiation management first. Um, the idea is that you can see um, uh, on the left, you can see solar radiation coming in. And some of it's been reflected off of clouds. Okay, some of it's not striking the Earth's surface, so it's not having a warming effect. So there's a balloon there, which is uh, seeding the atmosphere with sulfates, highly reflective particles, um, uh, aerosols that, that can um, reflect incoming solar radiation. You'll see the volcano there on the left. Volcanoes um, do have a, cool, a, a cooling effect, volcanic eruptions. This is Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, which erupted in 1991. And it was estimated that as a result of this eruption, the, um, the Earth's climate was somewhat cooler for the next two years than it otherwise would have been. You'll recognize this painting by Edvard Munch, the screen, and it's been, uh, th th there's some, been some speculation that the blood red sky that you see in the background there uh, was uh, in inspired by the red skies that were in Europe for about two years after Krakatoa erupted uh, in 1883. Uh, these, these are uh, aircraft contrails or vapour trails, um, as they're sometimes called. They, these, these do have quite a powerful cooling effect. Um, the reason we know that is in the aftermath of 9-11, when in the United States, all aircraft were grounded for three to four days. And what happened was that uh, as, a re as a result of that, the, uh, the planet was, uh, sorry, North America was slightly warmer than it otherwise would have been, and there was no natural explanation for this. The only explanation was the existing of aircraft vapour trails, which reflected some incoming solar radiation and cooled the planet. This is a jet aircraft. You'll, you'll recognise that there's um, uh, vapour trails coming out of the two engines, but note the wingtips. It's been suggested that aircraft fuel should be laced with sulfur um, that should be leached out of the wings so that uh, in order to increase the, the, the reflective effect of um, incoming uh, uh, solar radiation to, to, to cool the planet. Now, that's just, it's, it's, it's almost like you couldn't make it up, but somebody has made it up. This is an idea that's actually been suggested. And this, these are uh, aut automatic boats, uh, the suggestion being that these should ply the, um, the oceans and spray seawater into the atmosphere um, to make existing clouds whiter and therefore more reflective, and maybe even to seed new cloud formation. And it's, it's also been suggested that roofs should be painted white in order to reflect incoming solar radiation. So this is solar radiation management. As you can see, there's a range of techniques, both on the, um, the Earth's surface and in the atmosphere. And it's also been suggested that reflective space mirrors uh, could, could be, uh, could be uh, placed uh, either in orbit around the sun um, or in the Lagrange uh, zone, which is where the Earth's gravitational pull and the sun's gravitational pull balance out and there can be a reflective space mirror. These are the suggestions that are being made for solar radiation management. Um, the trouble though with solar radiation management is this, it doesn't bring down the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. The, we will continue to have high carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So we, we would be in a situation we've never previously been in with a, a geoengineered but high carbon dioxide world. How would the planet behave in response to that? The short answer is we just don't know. 
So what about carbon dioxide removal then? The problem, the, the headline is this, there are various techniques for carbon dioxide removal, but unfortunately none of them are really scalable, okay? They're, they're not within reach to the scale we need to remove sufficient carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is the Polar Stern, a German ship that um, tried to seed um, algae formation in the Southern Ocean by sprinkling um, nitrates and other nutrients into the atmosphere to increase phytoplankton um, uh, uptake of carbon dioxide and hopefully um, seed algae growth that would, um, uh, that would effectively lock up the carbon. Now this, the, the, the results of their, of their research were this, is that um, there is insufficient evidence that this will work as a long-term durable carbon dioxide removal technique. It can have modest short-term gains, and that's about it. It's also been suggested that water um, lays, uh, uh, should be... Um, uh, the uh, hydrochloric acid, not hydrochloric acid, carbonic acid, sorry, H2CO3, uh, could be pumped into basalt aquifers, um, and that this would, the, the reaction between basalt and um, carbonic acid would lead to the formation of carbonates, which would effectively, uh, lock, again, lock up some carbon as a result of the reaction between the acid and, and, and the basalt rock. Now, this has been um, tried and tested. This, this map shows uh, the, the red areas are where um, basalt uh, can be found and where it, it's possible, uh, in theory, uh, for this technique to be employed. It has been tried with, you know, modest success in Iceland, okay? But you'll see there's other areas as well, okay? So this is one of the carbon dioxide removal techniques that, that uh, has been considered by the, by the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. Is this the highway to the future? You'll recognize the wind turbines, the big tall structures, but you, you'll then see these smaller um, sort of ladle shaped um, structures. These are artificial trees. Now the proposal, well, this is from Klaus Lackner, uh, formerly of Columbia University. He proposed that artificial trees should be manufactured that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through a special resin, which carbon dioxide would stick to, but other gases would not, and that then this carbon dioxide would then need to be pumped underground. Okay, he estimated that we would need to manufacture uh, 10 million a year of these um, artificial trees, which would be big enough to fit into a standard shipping container. That was his proposal. Now, 10 million might seem a lot, but, but Professor Lackner argues that this compares favorably with the 73 million cars and commercial vehicles that are manufactured every year. In other words, we've got the industrial and engineering capacity to do this, um, but it's at the moment, it's been directed in the wrong place in the manufacturer of, of cars. So solar radiation is, is the more technically feasible. It, it, it could be done. Um, it would not cost, it would cost a few billions, I think, to um, get sulfates into the atmosphere or to get, um, uh, uh, reflective mirrors in space or whatever. Um, but it is very high risk. And as I say, on its own would result in a high carbon dioxide planet and the loss of marine life because ocean acidification would continue. Okay, the oceans would continue to have high levels of, um, of um, carbon dioxide, which as I say, forms uh, carbonic acid. It could be potentially catastrophic for the world's marine life. It's treating symptoms, not the cause. Carbon dioxide is the most desirable of the true strategies, but is the less technically feasible. Okay, it's, it's a, a good idea, but it, it, it's, it's not clear that we can scale this up in the time that's needed. So having looked at these two uh, sort of big, uh, if you like, policy proposals that, that we've been hearing a lot about this year, um, well, just to sort of ask, should we deliberately modify the climate? Um, should we implement a global scheme without universal agreement? And should or could we prevent the country from taking unilateral action to, to geoengineer um, the, 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 the climate through solar radiation management? That was um, uh, a question that was asked in, um, in your session yesterday, Lena, by, by Laura, when she discussed the different types of environmental war. So we've already considered that question at this conference, and it was a very useful discussion yesterday in that panel. 
This is um, Albert Einstein. Um, as you'll recognize him. Uh, the fact that people are searching for creative new solutions is good. We'll need as many of these as we can get. But uh, one of Einstein's more famous quotes is that problems cannot be solved by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So we need to think differently and more creatively if we are to deal with this problem. This, you might remember, is David Cassidy. Those of you who are old enough to remember David Cassidy from the 1970s. One of his songs contains um, arguably the most epistemologically profound lyrics ever sung by a 1970s teen idol. Um, how can I be sure in a world that's constantly changing? In case you're wondering why I'm showing David Cassidy, my sister played him all the time. Um, so I, I know his songs very well. Um, but it, talking of um, you know, how, how we can be sure, well, there are few, if any, certainties in the Anthropocene. The IPCC sixth assessment report predicts that climate change will get worse this century. The only debate is about the scale and pace of change. Geoengineering, for sure, would add yet another layer of uncertainty to climate science. It's, it's fraught with risk. So the only thing we can be sure about is that massive environmental change is inevitable, as a massive social change is in response to planetary change. The key question, therefore, is whether we can exert some control over this, or will these social changes take place as a, as a result of our uh, unwilling reaction? Are we at the mercy of forces beyond our control? One of the things I liked yesterday about um, uh, Daniela's talk uh, on education um, was, um, I'm very, in, uh, was uh, her insistence that we need to transform education in order to deal with, with, with this problem. And there's a distinction that I that I like to draw um, between environmental education and eco pedagogy. And I've been inspired by the work of Paolo Freire and Richard Kahn on the transformative potential of scholarship to achieve justice through future focused learning. So environmental education seeks to increase knowledge about environmental issues. It seeks to analyze different policy options and choices. Um, but without really necessarily coming down in favour of one or the other. It teaches about politics, but without advocating an explicitly political agenda. Ecopedagogy, on the other hand, uh, seeks to increase the public capacity to respond to environmental issues, to empower students and citizens, to enable them to do something uh, for the good. It, it's very critical of dominant power structures. It sees the global political economy as, as, a, as a huge part of the problem. It is an explicitly political problem with an agenda for transformative change. OK, so uh, whereas environmental education seeks to provide vocationally relevant teaching, ecopedagogy uh, seeks to exercise agency outside uh, the academy. Now, I don't know of any um, university that has adopted an ecopedagogical policy. Um, I, one of the things that might be made, criticisms uh, would be, you know, the, uh, the, if we were to adopt this, this will lead us into the realms of political activism and accusations of political bias. We are educators, we are not activists. So the relationship between education and activism is, is one that I constantly think about. Um, <clears throat> if you know of any universities that have, have adopted uh, eco-pedagogy, and, and, uh, I would really welcome hearing about them. But as far as I know, individual scholars are animated by this idea, but not institutions themselves. Is it time for universities to consciously move into this particular space and to confront the big questions that politicians are not asking and the media, with a few honourable exceptions, are not really covering? And how do we do this uh, in a way that connects with the lived experience of our, of our students? And perhaps we as educators need to ask the big unexamined question unexamined because nobody really asks it. Can we fully decarbonize the economy by moving to renewable energy sources such as wind and solar while energy demand continues to grow? Or does arresting climate change necessarily and unavoidably mean we must reduce our energy consumption if we are to decarbonize the economy? How many politicians ask that question? So there is some evidence that the eco-pedagogic approach is starting to take hold in our research and teaching. Um, 
But the question is, how, do, how, do, how should we change? Should we be engaging in other forms of action? I'd like to, to cite here some, some colleagues from the International Studies Association who, who, um, whose work has inspired me. Paul Steinberg from Harvey Mudd College, um, whose book, Who Rules the Earth, is well worth reading, argues that distinct, distinguishing between the normative and the analytical in the social sciences is a sloppy distinction. Normative concerns lie just below the surface of and drive most of our research. Medicine is taught at universities because we believe in human health engineering because we want safe bridges and buildings. So a more useful distinction to Steinberg is not whether uh, our research is driven by, by norms or by values, but whether it, research is committed to a public cause, such as caring for the earth, or whether in fact it's committed to a more narrow ideological or organizational agenda, such as business management. Commitment to a broad public cause is just one form of normativity. It need represent no threat to, to intellectual integrity. Indeed, it should be embraced. Peter Dalvern at University of British Columbia argues that those in the academy have a responsibility to expose the lies and duplicity of those in business and politics. He speaks against theory building for theory's sake. Richard Falk argues that social scientists spend too much time serving the system by thinking in terms of horizons of feasibility. What's possible? Um, in other words, it accepts the constraints of dominant political and economic systems, when in fact we should be reaching, he argues, for horizons of necessity. What do we need to do to deal with this problem? That's what should drive our action, he argues. And I think that brings to mind um, uh, the, the, the work of Robert, Co Robert Cox, that is seminal distinction between problem solving theory and critical theory. Problem solving theory seeks to work within existing constraints and parameters. It doesn't question dominant um, forms of organization such as the intergovernmental system of, of states. It doesn't question um, current um, dominant ideologies such as neoliberalism. It seeks to work within that. Critical theory on the other hand, takes the problem um, as, its, um, uh, as, as its sort of point of reference and says, what do we need to do to solve this problem? Okay, so there is evidence that, some, that, that, that the work has been done here. So in terms of recalibrating the social sciences, what, well, what can we do? Um, I would suggest the social sciences and other academic disciplines need to challenge entrenched economic discourses, and particularly the view that the economy should dominate over the environment. Um, I've, I remember Van Dana Shiva speaking at a conference, the Indian activist and scholar. She argued globalization is a social construct, and what is constructed can be deconstructed. She's particular, particularly critical of the role of big business. So the, the discipline of politics, perhaps, um, can argue what is the role of the state? The state is still there. It's not going to go away. But at the moment, we, we should perhaps ask ourselves, do we want a neoliberal state or do we want one that is focused more broadly on public goods provision? Oscar Guardiola Rivera's book, What If Latin America Ruled the World, um, looks at how we in the global north might look to Latin America for inspiration. So the problem is, but we can't just look to the states to tackle the, the problems of the Anthropocene. We need to work across multiple political spaces and actors. Orrin Young has spoken of the Anthropocene governance gap. The old political systems are still in place. They're still there, but they're unresponsive. They're not working. They're not agile enough. New political systems are not yet emerging. So we have a governance gap, he argues. That's a job for political scientists, I might suggest. Criminology and the law, um, uh, slight, starting to run out of time here, but very briefly, um, the work of Polly Higgins' book, um, Eradicating Ecocide, um, is, argues that the law should be thought from one simple overriding principle, namely do no harm. He argues that the state should prosecute on behalf of the public to stop ecocide and ecological harm. And when you think about it, after all, why should the state which is the representative of the public, domestically and internationally not do that. Destroying the earth is surely a missing crime in our, in our legal systems. And I'd like to mention here uh, one of my PhD students, Jodie Bettis, who's doing some work on, on legal geographies. Um, what, what explains the adoption of some states of um, 
eco side in their constitutions? What, why do some states adopt rights of nature in their constitutions, but not others? Um, so uh, I believe Jodie's watching this. So hello, Jodie. Um, and um, she's made a presentation um, to this conference, well, an, an asynchronous presentation on this, on this subject. So um, she would welcome your comments and feedback. Um, psychology, um, I, th I think it can, you know, why, why do people, uh, George Marshall, an activist in his book, Don't Even Think About It, draws from psychology when noting that decision making involves both emotive and rational elements. Emotionally, we tend to reach decisions quickly and impulsively. Rationally, we weigh evidence, risks and probabilities. But the, the emotional side of the brain often leads, he argues, and then it seeks evidence, rationalization and justification from the, the rational side of the brain. So some very clever, very intelligent people are constructing some plausible arguments that anthropogenic change is, is not happening. Climate denial, okay? It's well-funded and it's a big problem. It slows down our responses. How do we get around this? Well, perhaps psychologists can trick and contribute to that that debate and then economics in which values uh, are absolutely um, central um, uh, we can agree with Kenneth Boulding's distinction between a cowboy economy with an infinite frontier and a spaceship economy characterized by finite resources which we're rapidly using up yet our economic models essentially remain based on cowboy economics colonizing new spaces a standing tree has no real economic value but when it's cut down it has economic value as timber that can be bought and sold only market scarcity registers in our economic system how else do we explain occasional fall, falling oil prices at a time when we may already have passed peak oil scarcity in terms of oil left in the ground simply doesn't register so neoclassical economics operates over short-term time horizons. 25 years of very worthy scholarship on ecological economics as, as an alternative to the neoclassical model has been very strong on critique, but unfortunately has not really led to the introduction of a new economic um, paradigm. Um, I've been very inspired uh, by Kate Raworth's work. Um, so-called, uh, she calls it donut economics, but she argues that the economy should take place um, between uh, a social foundation and the ecological ceiling. The social foundation is what's necessary to cater to basic human needs. Everyone should have shelter, everyone should have food, everyone should have access to healthcare. So we should not enter that red zone in the center where critical human deprivation takes place, which is where unfortunately a lot of people living in poverty do live in, in that zone. Uh, but neither can we go beyond the ecological ceiling um, that would lead to planetary degradation. And she builds on the um, work of Johan Rockström et al, uh, their, their notion of planetary boundaries. And she looks at the planetary boundaries and she argues that our, our, our economic activity has exceeded the ecological ceiling for climate change, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, land conversion and biodiversity loss. It's an inspiring book, Kate Raworth, Donut Economics. I strongly recommend it. I just want to finish with this picture of, of four climate activists at the World Economic Forum in Davos two years ago. That's the picture that Associated Press circulated. This is the picture that was taken. And you'll see on the far left, uh, the only lady of colour, Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, was cropped out of that photo that was sent around the world. Here's the names of everybody um, that was involved. Now, I think that as well as talking um, to... Um, a problem of implicit racism who, of whoever edited that photo. It also speaks to the question of participation and whose voice should be heard, whose voices count. It was terrible to leave the four uh, European activists in the picture, uh, but to, to crop out Vanessa. Um, and she was seeking to introduce an African voice into, um, into, into uh, the, the consideration of the World Economic Forum at Davos. So she's written a book um, called A Bigger Picture, 
So you can see the illusion there, a bigger picture. And the fact that, that, that this is the bigger picture, the, the one we saw previously is, is, the, is the smaller picture. It's an excellent book. She's only 19. For somebody so young to have achieved such influence, her book is well worth reading. I recommend that. So thank you to you for being part of the solution for attending this afternoon. And those of you logging in from home, thank you very much indeed. Stay safe. Thank you for being part of the solution. And thank you for listening.